Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and also, thank you for your great patriotism and for being people who really love this nation uh, very much as I do. You know, uh, there's some people who have gotten the wrong impression about my enthusiasm for guns. And um, it's not so much that, that my positions on guns have evolved as it is that I've learned how to express myself better. Uh, you know, I used to assume that everybody knew what I was talking about when I would say something. And uh, that's not necessarily true, but that comes with uh, learning about the world of politics, which is different than the world of medicine. But I'm learning it pretty quickly, I gotta tell you. I, I had, a, had a good time yesterday on CNN with Chris Cormo as he was trying to trick me and ended up looking like a fool himself. But that was good. <laughs> But just uh, for the record, let me make it extremely clear that I am extremely pro-Second Amendment. There's no question about it. And I would never, <laughs> never allow for anybody to tamper with that right, because it is so important. Why do we have the Second Amendment? It was because our founders recognized that if our nation was invaded, if the citizenry had the ability to aid the military, we would be a much more formidable group of people. And that seems kind of far-fetched these days, but maybe it's not so far-fetched, particularly if we don't solidify our borders, particularly in the South, because, you know, we think We think about people from Honduras and Mexico and places like that coming in, but you know, there are people who are watching us. They're all over this world. They're called radical extremists, Islamic um, terrorists, and they are gonna get in here any way that they can. And when they get here, we need to be able to fight them, particularly if we have an administration that won't fight them. We have to be able to fight them ourselves. The second, the second reason for the Second Amendment was so that the people would be able to defend themselves against an overly aggressive government that wanted to exact tyranny in this country. And we don't ever want to see that happen. Now, when I was a youngster, I was always excited uh, to see guns. and. You know, as I got a little older and approached the teen years, I, I saw a lot of guns. Uh, they weren't necessarily carried by people who were law-abiding citizens either. And I remember seeing people lying on the ground with bullet holes waiting to die. I remember both of my older cousins who we lived with were killed. And I remember the drug dealers, many of whom we liked because they brought us candy. I remember the days when they would be killed. And there was a lot of carnage that I saw. And then as a surgeon, I spent many a night operating on people with gunshot wounds to their heads. And all of that is horrible. But I can tell you something, it is not nearly as horrible as having a population that is defenseless against a group of tyrants who have arms. And that's what we have to always bear in mind in this nation. I had an opportunity to really become a gun fan when I joined the ROTC. And uh, I joined the ROTC largely because I didn't have any clothes that were cool. And uh, so 
you know, people were always talking about your clothes. So, and then I saw somebody with this incredible ROTC uniform with all these medals and ribbons. And I said, yeah, I'm going to join ROTC. And, uh, but I, I joined in the latter half of the 10th grade. You're supposed to join in the first half of the 10th grade. But once I got in, you know, I was really ambitious. I said, I would love to become the city executive officer for the city of Detroit. That's the highest rank you can get in the ROTC. Nobody had ever done that in only four semesters. But I said, may as well try. And then I got in and I really started studying the manuals and learning all the stuff. And after my first semester, I got promoted to sergeant. And uh, the guy who was in charge of our ROTC program knew that I was somebody who really wanted to rise quickly up the ranks. So he said, Carson, the second hour class, they are, nobody can handle them. They're just terrible. Uh, if I assign you to be in charge of the second hour class and you can do something with them, I'll promote you to second lieutenant. Well, that would be a big jump. And then I'd be able to sit for the field grade examination with, with all the lieutenants and captains and majors and lieutenant colonels. So I came in there and I immediately realized why nobody wanted to be in there. I mean, like every other word out of their mouth, I'm kicking your, you know, and it was just a, a bad scene. But I studied them and I discovered something about them. They really had an affinity for guns and knives. So I said, <laughs> we got to take advantage of this. And uh, I said, you guys could probably really become the best at assembling, disassembling rifles and started a fancy drill team. And they became the best in the school and they're the best in the city. And they became a model class and I got promoted to second lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> Which then gave me an opportunity to sit for the field grade exam and I got the highest score in the city and again the next year. And bottom line is, I became the city executive officer for the city of Detroit. So it did work out. And I tell you that story just to let you know that Beside my medical career, I've had lots of instances where people said to me, no one's ever done this before. That doesn't bother me at all. Because, you know, I have a feeling that there is a power that's greater than me. And I always say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And, you know, that ROTC experience was great. I was offered a, a full scholarship to West Point, but I decided to go, to go the medical route. But my wife and I have always had a ton of friends in the military. We love the military. These are smart people. And one of the things that we are going to have to do as a country is when we have military conflicts, we have got to let the military people loose. We cannot micromanage them. They are smart. We also, we also need to recognize that we are allowing our military to deteriorate. Our Navy is the smallest size since 1917. We're in danger of becoming a regional Navy when we have to be able to project power all over the world. We have international interests, but a Navy that is shrinking. You know, our equipment is in a deteriorating state. The heart of our personnel is being eaten out by things like sequestration, cutting beyond the fat into the muscle and the bone. Our captains and majors and lieutenant colonels are being told that they're not being renewed. These are people we've invested enormous amounts of, of effort into who were to become the next tier, the next generation of leadership in our military, and we're dismissing them. That is hurting us. The morale is going down, and our military is moving this way, and those who wish to destroy us are moving that way. It's a perfect storm. We cannot let that happen. We have to get new leadership. But in, in closing, we need to understand that freedom is not free. You have to fight for it 
every single day. The people who founded this nation understood that concept, and they were willing to fight. And Thomas Hobbes, a 17th century English philosopher, said when he was talking about tyranny in Europe, he said the people of America will never have to worry about that because the people in America have guns. And for hundreds of years, the people in America have had guns. And for hundreds of years, the people in America have been free. And what we must now recognize is that the baton of freedom is in our hands. And the question is, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to submit to the secular progressives who try to use every opportunity to get rid of our guns? Or are we going to recognize that in order for the next generations to enjoy the same freedoms that we have, that we have to exercise the same kind of courage that people had before us? Think about Nathan Hale teenage rebel, a spy caught by the British, ready to be executed. He said, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my country. Think about all of those soldiers on D-Day who stormed the beaches of Normandy, being mowed down by the Axis forces, hundreds of bodies laying on the beach, a thousand dead bodies. Did our soldiers turn back? Were they afraid? Of course they were afraid, but they didn't turn back. They stepped over the bodies of their dead comrades, knowing in many cases that they would never see their loved ones or their homeland again. Why? Not for themselves, but for you and for me, so that we could be free. And now, the baton is in our hands, and we must make absolutely sure that we will never allow the right to keep and bear arms to be removed from those who follow us in this nation. Thank you very much.